Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I have some announcements and some responses to some things that you've um, asked me to respond to and then the topic we're going to get to in just a little bit is chemo brain and I'll tell you why I chose that when we get to that topic but um, the first thing is uh, you guys are keeping those um, emails coming about health professionals and um, professional opportunities and training and that sort of thing. So I decided that what might be helpful is a conference call. So I scheduled one for Wednesday, August 15th, next week at 8.30 p.m. And if you want to participate in that call, just send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. It's free and um, we can answer questions. I'll give you my perspective on some things. And we've done this before and it's always been well attended. And um, I think you guys get all your questions answered. So that's the first thing. And Speaking of free things, um, I don't know if you guys know, but if you sign up for free membership, one of the benefits is you get to do one free Conversations with Pam uh, workshop uh, where you can just ask questions. I do these group-wise about uh, 18 times a year, and you can choose a date that works for you and participate in the discussion. I enjoy those Q&A sessions a lot, and you can get your questions in. And if because we have people all over the world, the time frame doesn't work out, like you're sleeping when we have the Conversations with Pam call, we record them. You can send in your questions in advance and I'll answer them and then you can pick it up on the recording. So we try to be as accommodating as we can. So if you want to join for free, check out a few articles and recipes and do a conversations with Pam session. Once again, that email is pampopper at msn.com. Um, okay, now the next thing, I want to respond to a question that somebody asked, and I thought I would just tell you instead of writing it out on my comment section. Somebody said, well, what is your exercise program? What do you do? And the first thing I want to tell you is that I exercise for relaxation somewhat, so don't feel like you have to do all this. But um, And also, I have a gym and I have a yoga studio right here, which makes it really easy for me to do things. So here's the deal. I really love running. And uh, particularly in the summertime, I run outside. In the wintertime, I run on a treadmill, and I really don't like the treadmill running. So what I do is I binge watch Netflix uh, brain candy type of stuff while I'm running on the treadmill, which keeps me on the treadmill and uh, makes it more palatable. All right. So outside running in the good weather, inside running as soon as the wind chill hits 68 degrees because I do not like cold weather. Another thing I do, hot yoga right across the hall from my office. Love hot yoga. And I try to do that two or three times a week. And then I also do a couple of really good aggressive gym workouts every week too. So obviously you can tell I do more than one thing on some days and I'm not suggesting that you need to do that. I do think what you need to do is four or five days a week, some aerobic exercise, some strength training exercise, and yoga is good or some type of stretching is good. The older you get, the more you need it. And I think the reason I can still run at the age of 62 is because of the yoga classes. So I don't have any pain and joint problems and all that. I think the yoga classes have kept me in pretty good shape. Another question one of you asked is, do I ever feel like not exercising? And the answer is yes, and I do it anyway. And the reason is because I always feel better after I do it. Uh, the second thing is I feel guilty if I don't do it because it's, I guess that's part of forming a habit is it feels more unnatural to not do the thing you're supposed to do than to do it. And, um, and the third thing is it's just a discipline thing. I mean, if truth be known, probably in a given year's time, there are probably a handful of days I don't feel like coming in here, but I do it because um, I'm a grown-up. <laughs> I guess that's the best way to put it. People are counting on me to do my part, and when you're a grown-up, that's what you do, right? So there's a, there's a certain amount of that that governs my decision-making. Um, right along that line, somebody went to my personal website, drpampopper.com, and um, I have a blog, and I don't add to it as often as I should, but I do post things there, like the books I'm reading or have read and uh, that sort of thing. And I posted a couple of days of eating so people could see what my eating is like. And I got an email from somebody that said I'm really shocked, this person was really shocked, that I have um, Ezekiel bread toast in the morning for breakfast because they didn't think I ate any processed food. Well, the first thing is that we our eating plan does not call for the elimination of processed food. And yes, I do have Ezekiel toast. And just so you know, I do drink coffee. So some people think I'm tr clearly trying to kill myself. Of course, I'm kidding when I say that. Um, but um, you know, th there's nothing the matter with that. And I and I try to stay away from teaching or practicing dietary perfection. Perfection doesn't usually work out very well for people. So that's why we don't promote it here. Um, last thing I'll cover, and then I want to talk about chemo brain, is um, I get a lot of questions, and people will say. Um, what do you know about canker sores? 
well, I don't necessarily know how to answer that. Like, do you want me to write a term paper? Do you want me to, I mean, what do I know about this? I know a lot about a lot of things. Um, if you have a specific question, happy to answer it. Our libraries are designed to answer that kind of thing. There are articles on all these kinds of things in our libraries. And if you're a member on some level, depends on your membership level, what you get access to, um, you, can, you can search there for answers to a lot of your questions. I mean, I've been creating content for 23 years, so we do have a lot there. The other thing is people will say, um, well, my brother has lymphoma, what should he do? Well, that's a pretty broad question, and what should he do depends upon his age, his state of health, uh, the staging of the cancer, the options that have been put in front of him. So these are all informed decision-making type things. That's what we do here. And so our, our job is not to tell people what to do. It's to help them access information so they can decide what to do. So I'll continue to remind you guys of that because it's really hard for me to answer these giant open-ended questions when sometimes I don't have enough information to answer them. All right. so. Um, I did a newsletter article on brain fog. Actually, I should say the mythical condition of brain fog. Um, a couple people got mad at me and said, don't send me any more newsletters. Most of you thought it was pretty funny because I tried to do it tongue in cheek because it really is a made up condition. It's right up there with adrenal fatigue with the, and, and some of the same people who talk about adrenal fatigue, talk about brain fog, and they say the conditions are related. So I guess if you're making us, you know, stuff up, everything can be related. Um, having said that, the, some of the emails I got were, hey, I know that this brain fog thing is made up, but are there situations in which people experience genuine cognitive uh, dysfunction of some sort or diminished cognitive function? Um, and uh, somebody specifically asked about chemo brain, and I'd never written about that before, so I thought this would be a good time to create a, um, a video clip about it. And of course, this article will be published in the Health Grace Library uh, by the time you're watching this video. So first of all, it is a real thing. Chemo brain is a term that was coined by breast cancer survivors over 10 years ago to describe a common syndrome associated with chemotherapy. It's characterized by diminished cognitive function, impaired memory and organization skills, and can affect language, multitasking, daily function, and it can reduce the quality of life for patients significantly. There's a lot of published research on the topic, but it's been very difficult to quantify the percentage of people who are affected. And when I started doing some research, it shows the prevalence is somewhere between 15 and 70, 70%, 15 to 70%. That's a wide range. I think one of the reasons why it's difficult to quantify is that nobody is really doing follow-up research uh, regularly with cancer patients who get chemotherapy to try and quantify it. But anyway, according to some experts, it's caused not only by the chemotherapy, but by other forms of treatment, including radiation and by the cancer itself. And thus, some health professionals refer to it as cancer-related cognitive impairment, or CRCI. But studies do show that the condition is really due to toxicity from chemotherapy, particularly when it's received in really high doses. The proposed mechanisms of action include inflammation, damage to the vascular system, oxidative stress, direct injury to neurons, autoimmune responses, and anemia, all of which are consequences of chemotherapy treatment. There is also some evidence that lowered estrogen and progesterone levels as a result of chemotherapy and taking hormone blockade drugs like tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors are contributors as well. Other factors include drugs like benzodiazepines and sleeping pills, which are prescribed for pain and insomnia and depression, also common with cancer, and cognitive decline is a known side effect of these types of drugs. The condition has a marked influence of qual on quality of life. Actually, it sort of shocked me when I started reading studies about it. One study showed that 63% of cancer survivors who received chemotherapy reported issues with concentration and attention, 50% had problems with memory, and 38% reported difficulties with abstract reasoning. As many as 75% of patients report that their work performance has been negatively affected by this, 50% expressing extreme frustration, 33% reporting adverse effect on family relationships. One analysis of breast cancer patients reported that the patients reported to them they felt like they were chemo brain victims. The women said that their issues started during and continued after chemotherapy treatment. The symptoms lessened over time but did not fully resolve and women repeatedly report that they were not told about this side effect from chemotherapy by their doctors or nurses before they began their treatment. There are no official tests for CRCI or chemo brain and no known effective treatments. However, 
Um, I'll offer some suggestions based on other information that we have about how to aid cognitive function. And the first one would be to discontinue the use of drugs like sleep aids and benzodiazepines because they're known to negatively affect cognitive function. Diet and lifestyle changes have been shown to be helpful. We do have a little bit of research on that. And also cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to improve quality of life for affected patients. In one study in which CBT was used by 98 severely fatigued cancer survivors who were reporting chemo brain, patients reported improvement in both cognitive function and concentration. A few studies have shown that exercise also improves con uh, concentration and cognitive uh, um, abilities in cancer survivors. So I'm all about exercise anytime I have an excuse to promote it. Hydration, we know, has an effect on cognitive function, so patients who have chemo brain should make sure that they drink at least 64 ounces of water every day. Plant-based diets, particularly those high in antioxidant-rich foods, have been known to be protective for cognitive function and may be helpful in regaining cognitive function after chemotherapy. Cognitive decline, unfortunately, does not always resolve after treatment, and it seems to be a predictable side effect of cancer treatment with chemotherapy. It's rarely disclosed to patients prior to the beginning of their treatment, and it's another reason why patients really, really need to do their own research um, it, it, before any type of treatment. It's not just the cancer um, oncologists and people offering cancer treatment that are not necessarily disclosing everything uh, to patients so they can make balanced decisions about things. It's, it's widespread in medicine, and that's why this company is in business, because in order for you to be informed, you have to go outside the system to get information. So proceed with caution when you're getting any medical treatment, particularly cancer treatment. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.